I'm a card-carrying member of the market system, and I'm here to tell you it was the market system that failed. It was not the government. A huge percentage of the, of the bad loans came out of companies that, in fact, were regulated and were encouraged to do subprime lending. Where were the regulators during this period? They were gone. They were gone. They were nowhere to be found. The Federal Reserve helped create the housing bubble by flooding the financial system with money and by setting the short-term interest rate well below the Marxist natural rate. It's not government's heavy hand and overbearing relationship to the markets that caused the crisis. It's the lack of oversight on the markets that caused the crisis. It wasn't a light hand of, of government. It was a hand of government pounding on your head trying to make you make subprime mortgages. Welcome uh, to this sixth debate of the third season of the Soul Forum at the Subculture Theater in downtown Manhattan. I'm Gene Epstein, director of the Soul Forum. We're a special monthly debate series that features topics of special interest to libertarians and aims to enhance social and professional ties within New York City's libertarian community. We're partnered with Reason Magazine in presenting these debates, and you can catch audio and video of all our events on Reason uh, TV. This is an Oxford-style debate in which the audience initially votes for, against, or undecided on the resolution, and then again after the debate is over. Whoever moves the vote in his or her favor is declared the winner. Go into SohoVote.com to cast your initial vote. You'll find that tonight's resolution reads, the financial crisis of 2008 was caused mainly by government-induced distortion of markets rather than caused mainly by intrinsic market failure. Here to defend the resolution, John Allison. John, please come to the stage. Uh, speaking for the negative on the resolution, Mark Sandy. Mark, please come to the stage. Uh, now uh, we're going to start the PowerPoint presentation for the first time. Bear with us. We think it'll go well. Uh, John Allison, you have 15 minutes to defend the resolution. Please take the podium, John. Good evening. Uh, I was the longest serving CEO of a major financial institution when the recent Great Recession occurred. My company, BB&T, went through the crisis without a single quarterly loss. I was also leading BB&T's lending business in the early 1980s and CEO in the early 90s when the economy experienced other major corrections. I have a unique insider's perspective on the, the uh, recent financial crisis. I served on the committee of the Financial Services Roundtable for nine years trying to do something about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are quite appropriately called government-sponsored enterprises. It was a mathematical certainty <clears throat> that Fannie and Freddie were going broke from their enormous purchases of high-risk mortgages. We met with congressmen on numerous occasions, including Congressman Barney Frank. I called Barney the evil one because he actually is smart, unlike most of the others but uh, possibly because Fannie and Freddie were major financial contributors to the Democratic Party uh, and because Barney had a religious conviction that all Americans should be homeowners, he was willing to cheerfully behead anyone that st might stand in the way. That's by begin by drawing a distinction between two related but fairly separate questions about the busting housing bubble of 2008. First, what caused it? Second, once it did occur, why did it trigger the worst recession since the Great Depression of the 1930s? On the second question, while the toxic mortgages that choked the financial system were bound to bring an economic recession, I believe that the government's reaction to the crisis both prolonged the downturn and increased its severity. But in this debate, I'm here to focus only on the first question. What caused it in the first place? To defend the resolution, the financial crisis of 2008 was called mainly by government-induced distortion of markets rather than caused mainly by intrinsic market failure. Let's start with a government entity that has the greatest power to distort markets, the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve helped create the housing bubble by flooding the financial system with money and by setting the short-term interest rate well below the Marxist natural rate. 
The best estimate that I've seen of the difference between the interest rate the Fed artificially imposed and the market's natural rate come from a peer-reviewed paper co-authored by monetary economist George Selgin. Um, this chart tracks the main findings. It's the difference between the actual interest rate dictated by the Fed and what economists estimate to be the natural market rate based on changes in price inflation and in productivity. The horizontal line on the chart traces the neutral zone where the market interest rate and the Fed's rate uh, converge. Monetary policy becomes loose when the fluctuating line cuts below the neutral line. <clears throat> and you can see that starting in year 2000, monetary policy soon became even looser than it was in the 70s. And it's no coincidence that starting in the year 2000, the bubble that had already been forming in the price of homes really began to take off. The next chart, um, hopefully, uh, comes from Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Schiller, and it's based on an index number that adjusts the average house's price for improvements in quality and from overall price inflation. It shows many bubbles formed in the 70s and 80s, and also shows, shows that from 1996 to 2000, a very similar mini, mini, bubble, mini bubble had begun to form. But instead of receding as it had in the past, the price started to jump to new highs by 2001 and 2002. Quoting Schiller, the number one boom occurred from February 1997 to October uh, 1996 when house prices, uh, real house prices increased 74%. From 1997 to December 2003, real house prices increased 45%. Why was the looseness in Fed policy having a special impact on housing prices? Loose monetary policy has been referred to as the punch bowl that gets markets drunk. In this case, the government offered a second punch bowl of the housing se segment. Starting in the mid-1980s, it, it orchestrated a massive effort to boost home ownership, mainly implemented by the giant government-sponsored enterprises Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. In a recent article, Mark Zandi has actually summarized this story pretty well. He wrote that it was the effect of the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, to, quote, expand lending to historically underserved families that caused the crisis. Marx continues, the government requirement that Fannie and Freddie helped expand lending to these families caused them to inappropriately lower their lending standards in the lead up to the crisis, which drove other private mortgage lenders to do the same and created the downward spiral of unsustainable debt that led to the housing collapse. I should add, however, that Mark calls this story mythology and even pernicious. I regard the story as quite true. The government's actions <coughs> happen in plain sight. When President Clinton announced his national home ownership strategy in June 1995, he spoke of the need to make it easy for people to own their own homes. In 1996, the Department of Housing and Urban Development began setting annual goals for the proportion of mortgages of low and income families that Fannie and Fannie were required to buy. The goal was increased each year, rising from 40% in 1996 to 50% by 2001. In a press release dated July 1999, President Clinton announced that the home ownership rate is at an all-time high, with more than 66% of all American families owning their homes, <clears throat> and reported that goals of Fannie and Fannie's purchase of mortgages were being raised, quote, over and above the $1.9 trillion in mortgages for 21.1 million families that would have been generated if the current goals had been retained. The policies continued under Clinton's successor, George W. Bush, a 2004 press release from Fannie Mae boasted to having provided over $3 trillion in funds for over 28 million underserved families over the course of the previous decades. These policies were having effect. The climate home ownership rate <coughs> shown in this chart uh, reflects the demand pressure was propelling house prices even higher. As this chart shows, the home ownership rate had actually climbed to a record high of 66% by the second quarter of 1998, even earlier than President Clinton had thought. By fourth quarter 2003, it had jumped to 68.6%, .6%, peaking at 69% in second quarter 2004 before it began to fall. From 1997 through 2003, Freddie and Fannie alone purchased $1.7 trillion worth of high-risk mortgages. That doesn't include active participation in high-risk mortgages by government agencies that include the Federal Housing Administration and the Veter Veterans Administration. It also doesn't include the rigorous enforcement of the Community Reinvestment Act 
and other community lending deals which require that private lending institutions give mortgages to lower income families. I emphasize that all this happened in the period leading up to 2003 for a special reason. A few years ago, I had the privilege of sitting next to Mark on a panel about the financial crisis and hearing his main arguments. He repeats these same arguments in the article I just requoted from, uh, published in September. Mark tries to refute the idea that government policy was cri crucial in creating the, the housing bubble by citing data from 2004 through 2006. But by fo focusing on 2004 to 2006, Mark has placed himself in the position of a guy who walks into the theater in the last reel of the movie. This chart, um, released by federal housing regulators, reveals what happened before Mark arrived at the scene. It attributes to each major set of institutions from 1990 through 2007 the mortgages that were actually used to purchase homes in it, it each year, and it actually understates the share attributable to Freddie and Fannie. Notice the chart has a breakout for private label securities. These are bonds that are backed by a pool of mortgages. Holders of these bonds receive their payments out of the payments made on the mortgages. Fannie and Freddie routinely bought massive amounts of whole mortgages and packaged them in this form. And the private sector did the same. And, and in fact, Freddie and Fannie bought hundreds of billions of dollars worth of these private label securities to help meet their affordable housing goals imposed by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. But since the chart doesn't reflect these acquisitions, the percentage share on this chart overstates the share of, of purchased mortgages held by the private sector and understates the share held by Freddie and Fannie. But the chart still shows that in the crucial years from 1997 to 2003, the combined share of the Fannie and Freddie plus that of the FHA and Veterans Administration was always greater than 60% of all mortgages. This, with this commanding share, they drove the market. In, in, dollar terms, the value of these purchases of mortgages more than doubled from $440 billion in 1997 to $886 billion in 2003 before leveling off. The remainder went to the private sector, the combined share of banks and other institutions plus issuers of private label securities. From 1997 to, 19, to 2003, the private sector share was almost always, was, was always less than 40 percent. Its share started to rise in two parallel 2004, but barely exceeded 50 cent in the single year 2005. And as mentioned, even these figures are over, overstated because so many private label securities were bought by F Freddie and Fannie. Mark should read the January 2019 working paper called Mortgage, Mortgage Rich Since 1990, from which I took these figures. Analysts with the federal agency that issued this report state quite clearly we show that mortgage risks had already, already risen in the 1990s, planting the seeds of the financial crisis well before the actual event. Why did the private sector get more heavily involved in late 2003? The price bubble government policies had created lured this in. Um, this chart um, on 12-month house price in increases, mainly in California, reels a key factor. Notice that by June 2000, when the bubble had already taken off, prices began to rise 10% a year, and, and by December 2003, by 16.4%. Now you say, give a, uh, now you gave a mortgage to a high-risk debtor with a down payment of just 3%. If the, if the debtor can't meet the payments, you can always help him refinance, and the home will be worth more, at least 10% a year, or you can foreclose and sell the house for more than you uh, lend on it. Now, I had two other factors that were fueling the mania. As mentioned, Fannie and Fannie were buying up whole mortgages and private mortgage-backed securities by the hundreds of billions of dollars. So the private financial institutions believed they could always sell their toxic mortgages to these deep-pocket government-sponsored enterprises that had the backing of the federal government. On the top of that, there was a delusion that Alan Greenspan, head of the Fed, would remain in, who remained in office through January 2006, would come to the rescue if anything went wrong. The banker you love to hate, the guy in the starch collar at the branch bank on Main Street who would turn you down for a mortgage because your income wasn't high enough, got elbowed aside by banksters like uh, Angelo Mazzello of the mortgage issuer Country Ride who would give anybody a mortgage because the government was there to assume the risk. Many of these banksters did indeed get bailed out by the government, as did Freddie and Fannie. I remain the banker you love to hate, and I knew at the time that Fannie and Freddie were going bust and that Greenspan had created a financial house of cards. I've heard Mark claim that private sector loss and banned mortgages were much higher than losses incurred by the government. I've seen a Moody study published that tries to butter this claim. In fact, a plausible look at the data shows the opposite. 
that a government accounted for even greater losses. But it's true that private sector losses were quite substantial when you consider its much smaller commitment. One reason is that Freddie and Fannie had the power as pay-setting institutions backed by the government to cherry-pick the, the worst mortgages, uh, the best of the worst mortgages, uh, leaving the private sector with the more risky mortgages. The private sector also entered the market much later at much higher prices with mortgages whose average dollar value was higher. So when the crash in prices came, the lower down payment mortgages they held were underwater much sooner and therefore lost much more. I've heard Mark make the point that other countries experience house price bubbles. That's true, uh, since they too have central banks. Central banks that have to follow the lead of the Fed because the U.S. has the world's reserve currency. Uh, but the key difference was that when the bus came, the U.S. had a much larger proportion of toxic mortgages than any other country. I've heard the excuse Mark repeated, uh, repeat the excuse given by Greenspan and his successor, uh, Ben Bernanke, the housing market was distorted by a savings glut but abroad, from abroad. But much of what they call a savings glut was monetary expansion globally by central banks that was only possible because of the Federal Reserve's action. The so-called savings glut distorted our housing market mainly because of the huge distortion imposed by Freddie and Fannie and the Fed itself. It's hard, to under, it's hard to overestimate the negative impact on lending by private lenders to the regulatory attack on banks, forcing banks to do lending that they weren't designed to do, uh, and, and that really got the ball rolling that led eventually to the financial crisis. Thank you very much. Well, you still got your full 15 minutes, Mark, even though uh, John uh, finished earlier. Mark Zanti, please come to the podium. Yeah. Well, well, thank you, Gene. Uh, thank you, Soho Forum, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's, it's a great place, great venue, uh, very intimate. Gene and I go way back, I think, um, must be 25 or 30 years. So thank you for the invitation. And it's great to be on the stage with uh, John Ellison, uh, a great guy, uh, fantastic bank. BB&T is, is certainly one of the best. Uh, we, uh, I've worked with BB&T over the years and still do, and um, as testimonial to your, your leadership. So uh, you've done a fantastic job. I just want to say that I'm not just an egghead economist. I am the chief economist of Moody's Analytics. Uh, but uh, I think it's apropos, uh, given the the uh, subject matter, just to give you a little bit of, of context about me. Uh, I started my own company, an economic consulting firm, with my brother and my best friend, and we sold it to the Moody's Corporation uh, now almost 15 years ago. It's hard to believe. And when, when we sold it, we were a good-sized, small company, about uh, a little over 100 employees with offices in different parts of the world. So I've been a part of a startup. I've been part of a uh, small business, and now I'm part of a large multinational corporation. I'm also on the board of directors of mortgage, uh, MGIC, a mortgage insurer, one of the largest in the country, and I'm the lead director of Reinvestment Fund, which is a CDFI. If you don't know who, what that is, it's a nonprofit uh, investment community development financial institution. Uh, we invest in underserved communities all across the country, including in this region of the country. So the point is, I am a card-carrying member of the private markets. Uh, I know it well. Uh, I do think one more important point, I am uh, part of the Moody's Corp, but I'm not part of the rating agency. So I'm totally separate from the rating agency uh, and um, uh, in a, a separate independent uh, organization. OK. Uh, let me uh, begin by saying that um, there are many causes for the financial crisis. Uh, plenty of blame to go around, uh, except me. I, it's not my fault. Uh, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, although uh, President Trump uh, did try to pin it on me back in the 2016 campaign a press release. He didn't like what I was saying about his proposed economic policies. Yeah, and uh, apparently I, I was the one who started the crisis, but uh, I had nothing to do with it. I was OK with that when it turned out that he also went after Warren Buffett in the same press release, uh, I'm okay to be in the same press release with Warren Buffett. You know, anything he's doing, I'm, I'm, I'm good with. So, uh, uh, but I, I had nothing to do with it. Um, I think the principal reason for the crisis, however, was a colossal 
collapse in uh, the private markets, in the financial system. Uh, and more specifically, in the uh, complete failure in the mortgage securitization process, the private mortgage securitization process, the private label securities that John had in one of his charts. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, in the securitization process, lenders originate, mortgage lenders originate loans. Uh, those loans are then uh, sold to uh, in investment banks, uh, trusts. Uh, investment banks package those loans uh, and take the principal and interest gener generated by those loans to back securities, and mortgage securities, that they, the investment banks then sell to uh, global investors uh, across the globe. Of course, the rating agencies rate those securities and uh, the global investors use those ratings as uh, an input into their decisioning around whether to invest in those securities. That's the mortgage securitization process. It's still functioning today. It's a shadow of what it was. But you know, uh, back in the day, prior to the crisis, it was, it was rip-roaring. And the mortgage securitization process, and again, I'm speaking to you as a person in the middle of the process watching it, was uh, broken. The machine was uh, completely uh, out of sync uh, from the beginning to the end. Lenders, unscrupulous lenders, originated loans that they knew uh, would uh, be unaffordable, that ultimately borrowers who took on those mortgages would not be able to pay them. Um, in many cases, they weren't the BB&Ts of the world, not the regulated banking system. They, they weren't the real problem. It was the non-banks and the so-called shadow system, the countrywides of the world, the Angelo Mozillas of the world, the new centuries of the world. Uh, that's where we got ninja loans, no income, no job, no asset. Uh, of course, borrowers weren't completely innocent in all this. Uh, we had many uh, home buyers that were investors. Uh, in fact, at the peak of the investment flipping in the housing market back in 2005, 2006, nearly 20% of all homes that were sold were to investors. And of course, these investors passed themselves off as uh, homeowners because if they were homeowners, they'd get better terms on the mortgage loan a lower interest rate, and they didn't have to put as much down into the mortgage. So they lied about it. And so there was plenty of fraud going on in the mortgage market at this time. So I, in fact, I remember one just very incredible statistic. In Ocean City, New Jersey, that's, a, that's actually a metropolitan area. There's a little over 400 metropolitan areas across the country. In Ocean City, New Jersey, in 2005, and this is HMDA data, Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, 70% of all the loans uh, originated in that year were to, to investors, to investors. So um, lenders were uh, deeply involved. And the investment banks, uh, they were making a, a, they were minting money uh, and, uh, and buying those loans, securitizing them and selling them off. And the entire business model was revolved around volume. We needed, they needed to generate uh, high levels of activity, high levels of securitization. And so they took any loan they got, they, they securitized it, sold it off to global investors, and they went on to the next deal. Rating agencies were involved. Uh, believe it or not, back in the day, prior to the crisis, the rating agency's policy was, and this was a stated policy that was written for everyone to see, it was public information, that the rating agency would not underwrite the loans themselves. They took the information that the investment bank gave them about the mortgage loans and use that in their decisioning around what rating to provide on the securities. Uh, obviously, that was uh, an egregious error in the sense that you know, these loans, it was quite obvious, many of them were far fraudulently, poorly underwritten, but no underwriting was done. But again, that was kind of the way the rating agency, that was the way the rating, agency, rating agencies operated with regard to other debt, and they just applied that same business model to the, to the mortgage loans. Um, and then there's the global investors. Uh, the global investors, they were uh, inundated with capital. Uh, we did have a global savings glut, uh, largely, most fundamentally, because it was a period after which China had entered into the World Trade Organization and came on the global scene very rapidly. They started to run a very large current uh, uh, trade surplus and a current account surplus. They were getting a lot of dollars in trade. I mean, they came into the WTO in 2001. By the mid-2000s, they were rolling in cash and that money. Those were dollars that had to come back into the United States. 
They went to investment managers. Investment managers were flooded with the cash. They didn't know what to do with it. They didn't stop doing due diligence. They solely relied on the ratings, and uh, they plunked down good capital on uh, these bad loans. Uh, and it goes beyond that. I mean, exacerbating uh, all of this uh, were different features of the system that uh, ultimately failed. Uh, there were uh, investment vehicles out there that uh, so-called structured investment vehicles, CIVs, you may remember, and the Citibank CIV that blew up uh, in 2007, 2008, that uh, borrowed money, short-term money at a low interest rate, took that money and used that to finance purchases of subprime mortgage securities and other debt, mortgage, uh, uh, mortgage uh, bonds. Uh, and of course, uh, when you borrow short and you're funding a, a purchase of an asset that's long duration, you set yourself up for a problem if short-term interest rates rise and funding gets cut off, which is exactly what happened. The derivative market took off unregulated. Uh, that was key to allowing investors and speculators to double down, triple down on their bets in the mortgage market. And of course, most fundamentally, the entire financial system, including the banking system, maybe not bb and but most banks, including Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which is their, uh, the, the reason for their failure, was that they were undercapitalized. They hold very little capital cushion cash in the cash in a sense in the bank that was sitting there in case uh, to, uh, to pay for losses that they would ultimately uh, suffer. And they didn't have enough capital to withstand uh, the losses that came. So the system uh, uh, really uh, was totally broken uh, uh, during this period. And you can, you can see this in the, uh, my first, I have a couple, uh, three slides. Uh, let's see, go forward. Yeah, this is uh, this. This shows you uh, how significant the uh, growth was. You know, there's an old a a banking adage. It goes, and maybe John knows this. Uh, the, the banking adage it goes, if it's growing like a weed, it's probably a weed, uh, and that describes the private mortgage market. And you can see that here. This shows the share of mortgage debt outstanding, residential mortgage debt outstanding that's accounted for by the private label securities market. This is the securitization market that I've been talking about, the, the private market. And, uh, and con contrasting that with the share of mortgage debt that's accounted for by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And this accounts for every mortgage asset, whether it's a loan or security on the balance sheet. You can see that the uh, private label securities market uh, took off, uh, there's the weed, uh, between mid-2003 and mid-2007, and share of mortgage debt outstanding rose by over 10 percentage points. By the way, this is not originations. This is mortgage debt outstanding, uh, for those who follow this carefully. So that gives you a sense of, in terms of origination volume, the share going to the private label securities market was substantially more than this. And you can see at the same time, no surprise, the share of mortgage debt accounted more accounted for by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, fell by 10 percentage points. So it's the private label securities market that came on very rapidly, grew very quickly, the weed, and it overtook the, the agencies, Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac. And you know, it clearly led to the egregious um, uh, problems that we had during this period. And of course, the losses re reflect that. This shows who suffered the most, uh, who suffered the losses during the financial crisis. The, the lending that was done through the financial crisis. This is just adding up in dollar terms the defaults. The blue bar represents the losses uh, on mortgage loans originated in the bubble in 2003 through 2006, early 2007 by the private market. And the green line represents uh, the losses on loans backed by the government, including Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I mean, obviously they weren't part of the government prior crisis, but they were implicitly backed and I included them. And it also includes FHA and VA. Through the entire crisis, total losses on all mortgage loans was just over a trillion dollars. So if you look at all the losses and all the mortgage loans originated during this bubble period, it was about a trillion dollars. For context, there's $10 trillion of mortgage debt outstanding. So the loss rate on mortgage debt outstanding was 10%. 10% of the value of all mortgage debt defaulted. If you add up the blue bars over time, that comes up to $550 billion. So that's over half of all the losses that were incurred during as a result of the crisis 
on those loans originated during that period were in the private market. Over half, they accounted for 10, 20% of the market. They account for over half the losses. And of course, the, pro the government sector, much a smaller share than, than uh, their debt outstanding. Now, let me end this way. I'm not saying, and I'm not arguing, the government didn't play a role in all of this. It did. But it's not what John thinks it is. It's not, the he it's not government's heavy hand and overbearing relationship to the markets that caused the crisis. It's the lack of oversight on the markets that caused the crisis. Where were the regulators during this period? They were gone. They were gone. They were nowhere to be found. The first guidance that uh, regulators, the Federal Reserve, the OCC, the FDIC issued with regard to subprime lending was in July of 2006. The bubble was already bursting by that point in time. Right? They, there, was no uh, there was no regulation of the derivatives. AIG lorded up on $3 trillion of notional value of derivatives. There was no regulation or oversight of the structured investment vehicles. In fact, when the city CIV blew up, it was, it, it was a surprise to everyone, including the regulators. Uh, the lenders that blew up, the, the guys who took out the system, they, they weren't the regulated banks. They were the non-regulated banks. It was the countrywide of the world that took out Bank of America. It was the new centuries of the world that took out the financial system. So it's not the government's heavy hand. It's, in fact, just the opposite. The government was nowhere to be found. And it was the government that, at the end of the day, saved the day. And you can see that here. This shows uh, a measure of stress in the financial system. It's the so-called TED spread. It's the difference between the rate on LIBOR, that's the interest rate that banks uh, charge each other for buying and lending to each other, relative to the uh, treasury yield, which is a risk-free rate. So the, the, if, that's, if that difference increases, that stress in the marketplace, the, the bankers are saying to the, to the other bankers, I don't believe that you're going to be able to pay me back, so you've got to pay me a higher interest rate. And you can see that uh, the, the earthquake started back in uh, 2007 with Bear Stearns. Uh, it became earth-shattering you know, in 2008 on the other side of Lehman Brothers and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And it was only with government intervention, ultimately the TARP, which was the bailout fund, and interestingly enough, a factoid, the day this spread peaked, and in my mind, the day the financial crisis began to come to an end was the day that the FDIC guaranteed bank debt, saying it's money good if you invest in bank debt. And uh, that marked the end of the crisis and, and the stress test. So I'm a card-carrying member of the market system. And I'm here to tell you it was the market system that failed. It was not the government. Thank you. So. So, uh, uh, rebuttal from uh, John Allison, and uh, can we, uh, you got a phone call, Rudolph? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, Jane Metton can help you there, our uh, timekeepers, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, okay, start the timing. Sorry for that pause. Um. Mark comments and displays closely tracked articles and recorded talks that he's already published. He simply decided in advance that the housing bubble only began in late 2003. Any academic would say no. Uh, it started a long time when the private sector started to become more involved in the mortgage market. By walking into the movie, the final really misses all the decisive events that occurred until late 2003. In the January 2019 working paper called Mortgage Risk Since 1990, Analysts with the federal agency this year's report say we show that the mortgage risk had already risen in the 90s, planning to see for the financial crisis. Since Mark's own data revealed that the government dominated the mortgage market in the 90s and early 2000s, you should find the statement to be sufficient evidence the real story began before the 2004 period. Two, uh, here are two other snapshots of uh, the timing of the housing bubble. This one traces house prices to rents, which hit a new high in December 2000. In a, and in a paper published uh, titled House Prices Bubbles in March of 2003, an economist with the Federal Reserve in, in uh, San Francisco reported with concern that the ratio between house prices and rents were resembling a price bubble. Remember, it's prices that are bubbles. In this chart, uh, number two here, 
uh, I again show how private institutions were lowered in the public into the by the double digit increase in house prices as early as August 1919 in New England. Mark seems to think it's critical to show figures comparing mortgage losses by government versus those by the private sector. I'm not sure that's true, but anyway, as Mark has not already published these same figures in a Moody's report, by itemizing the mortgage losses that Mark admits, it should help to gain perspective on the long reach of government. Mark estimates losses of $275 billion are based solely on those directly incurred by FHA, Fannie, and Fetty. This table adds itemized losses directly incurred by government or losses for which government is directly responsible. Notice that we end up with a full tally of $516 billion. Our first item of $41 billion comes right from Fannie and Fannie's financial statements is the amount that private insurance companies paid them on losing mortgages. So while the $41 billion wasn't technically a loss to the enterprises, it was a loss imposed on the private sector by government. Similarly, Fannie and Fannie were able to get private sector issuers to buy back many of their losing mortgages with threats. The results of our second item uh, managed to impose on the private sector $28 billion. The $85 billion item represents losses that resulted from Fannie and Fannie purchases of more than $700 billion worth of subprime mortgage-backed securities and $150 billion of high-risk securities called Alt-A. The $40 billion item represents losses on huge private sector deals that only got implemented in response to government enforcement of the Community Re Investment Act. And the final display shows that losses properly attributed to government may be well higher than losses attributed to the private sector. We start with this the figures published in Mark's Moody study and make plausible adjustments. To begin with, we reduced Moody's estimate of private losses by $139 billion based on the National Bureau, Bureau of Economic Research working paper published last April, which reports very different figures from Moody's. University of Chicago economist Paul uh, Harold Ugly, co-author of the paper, writes in an email that he contacted Mark twice asking for his sources and Mark uh, wouldn't provide them. Finally, we reduced Moody's number by $220 billion to reflect all the losses Mark attributes to the private sector for which government is actually responsible. The result is government accounts for more than half the losses. I would also say absolute certainty from personal experience that a substantial percentage of private losses were driven by significant regulatory pressure on private institutions. There wasn't a light hand of, of government. It was a hand of government pounding on your head trying to make you make subprime mortgages, uh, and we have the consequences of that. Thank you. Uh, five minutes for Mark. Uh, who didn't I contact? Here, I'll give you my card. Give it to give it to the guy here. I get contacted by lots of people. I maybe I don't know. I. I uh, send them my way. I'll, I'll be happy to set them straight. So, John, uh, my read of your um, argument is uh, twofold. Uh, one uh, is that the Federal Reserve was uh, overly stimulatory with monetary policy in the lead up to the bubble, and that exacerbated uh, housing demand and uh, therefore house price growth and ultimately uh, helped uh, create the bubble. Um, and second, that uh, Fannie and Freddie, uh, because of their very aggressive uh, affordable lending, uh, lending to underserved groups, uh, helped to stimulate um, a more broader erosion in underwriting standards across the system. Uh, and, I, and I'd say uh, on, on both, uh, I think they're uh, bit players in the story. Uh, with regard to uh, the Federal Reserve, um, they did straight up monetary policy. Uh, they, if you look at the interest, I mean, if you go back, I, I can remember the statistics pretty well, that the federal funds rate hit a bottom, that's a key interest rate the Fed controls, hit a bottom of 1% in uh, the wake of the uh, bursting of the stock market bubble in 2004, and then rose to five and a quarter percent at the peak just prior to the crash. If you kind of look back at that period and you look at the things that the Fed looks at in trying to just set monetary policy, the so-called Fed's reaction function, straight up monetary policy, unemployment, inflation, financial market conditions, um, you know, broader global economic conditions, uh, 
the, the funds rate was very, very close to, you know, what uh, those traditional approaches to monetary policy would be. Could you argue they could have done a better job? In hindsight, obviously. Uh, you know, that everyone screwed up, uh, but it's hard to put place the, you know, the blame, significant amount of blame on them. They were just, they followed uh, the, the script, and historically the script has worked pretty well. Since 1913, when the Federal Reserve was put on the planet, uh, clearly our financial system and economy have performed much better than, than prior to that period. With regard to Fannie and Freddie, um, I don't get that one at all. And I know there are some proponents of the idea that you know, Fannie and Freddie's uh, lending to underserved communities uh, is the cause, a major cause of what happened. Um, I don't think there's any evidence of that. Uh, in, in fact, the academic literature is very clear. There's been uh, a dozen different studies done on this issue, controlled experiments. Uh, St. Louis, I, I would, uh, I would uh, direct you to a couple of very good studies that have done by the St. Louis Fed and the Fed Board of Governors. Uh, and uh, they come to the conclusion that the affordable housing goals had nothing to do with uh, what happened. And, you know, I, I, I am uh, in fa I think Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, because of uh, their mission, should be geared towards providing uh, affordable credit to uh, lower and middle income households. That's what they were put on the planet to do, and, and that's uh, uh, their mission. Uh, I don't think the affordable housing goals are a particularly good way of getting them to achieve their mission, uh, but it's not because they were the cause of the crisis or they lead to poor underwriting. It's because they're totally ineffective. There's very little evidence, in fact, no evidence that those goals, uh, those affordable housing goals, have had anything to do with uh, Fannie and Freddie's underwriting. So, you know, both your arguments, uh, you know, I wouldn't completely dismiss them, but if I had a list of 10 different things, 10 different causes of the crisis, by the way, there are so many reasons for this crisis that one could write a book, and I did. I did, yeah. It's worth $1.99 on eBay, but I would suggest you go read it because it kind of lays out, you know, who's to blame. The Fed is a chapter in the book, but it, it is definitely a bit player in all of this. Thank you both uh, for spirited uh, exchange. Uh, we now move to the Q&A part of the evening, and uh, would you guys uh, willing, be willing to do a little grunt work and move your chairs? And I think that our sound guy wants to move the mics to make sure that uh, our klutzy guys do not uh, wreck the mics. Uh, and uh, we're going to do that. And uh, we are going to start uh, with, uh, I guess, moderator's prerogative to, uh, to, to sort of pick up on a strand uh, for each of you. Uh, uh, First, uh, John Allison, do you acknowledge uh, what's your reaction to uh, uh, Mark's point that there was a failure of regulation uh, in, in, uh, in the uh, that there was a, a major sin of omission on the part of government uh, vis-a-vis -vis the behavior of the private sector? Well, it was, a fa it was a failure of regulation, but it was the inverse of what Mark says. There was huge pressure on financial institutions to make low-income housing loans. And it's important to understand the context, because it really started with Bill Clinton, and it wasn't about low income. It was about minority lending, specifically the African American community. So it was a huge pressure on financial institutions, and you really couldn't argue just about low income lending, because a bank like BB&T, we were in low income areas. But you had to prove that you were being super careful, <laughs> and, and a lot of banks made a lot of regular loans that didn't get classified as as subprime loans to low, uh, not low income borrowers, but borrowers with lousy credit histories. You have to understand the lending business to understand that income to, to debt service is one factor, but a bigger factor is just what well, people are going to pay you. And, and that encouraged this bubble and also became almost a moral campaign on the regulators' part. So it was, it was, yes, there was a lot of regulatory pressure, but it was in the wrong direction from a credit quality. And by the way, a lot of regulators knew that. You could hear them. They would tell you that. Uh, Mark, comment on that? And uh, before I ask a question, and comment on John's answer, or, or do you want to pass? Uh, up to you. I never pass. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, let me tell you a story. So uh, it was late 2005. Um, 
I was asked to go uh, brief the uh, FOMC. This is the Federal Open Market Committee, the, the folks at the Federal Reserve. Uh, Greenspan was, uh, this was just towards the end of his uh, tenure at the Fed. And they asked me to come speak about uh, the developing issues with regard to the mortgage industry. This was late 2005, so you know, we were still a long way from the crisis. And, but it was, you know, you could feel things getting very frothy, a lot of investors, flippers, house price growth had now gotten into the double digits. And uh, I had some insight into it because uh, I was able to tap into the rating agency's data uh, with regard to, because really, it's hard to, hard to believe this, but back at the time, we didn't even know, there wasn't even a clear definition of subprime mortgage. We just kind of throw that term around. But in 2005, there, no one really knew what that meant. Uh, so, but we had data from the, from the private label securities, and so I could look at that and uh, uh, gain some insight into what was going on. So I go into the meeting at the Fed in D.C., and I give my presentation. It might have been, I don't know, a uh, half hour, 45 minutes, and they listened. And at the end of that, there was not a single question, not one question, not one. And I, and I was pretty dark. I was saying, this is a problem. This is a weed. If it continues, we're going to have a real problem. And, and I was writing extensively about it at the time. And I, I wrote a piece called, Where Are the Regulators? And I heard, I had not one question. When I left that meeting, you know, Green, Greenspan was right there. And he's looking at me, not a question. I left that meeting. I go, oh my gosh, I have this wrong. I must have this wrong. They are sanguine about this. They don't think there's an issue. Uh, there's not a problem. Now here's the thing, Greenspan had a stated policy of, I'm not gonna worry about bubbles. This is not my problem. You know, Greenspan had, you know, he did monetary policy and, and the Fed is the key regulatory body in the system, right? So he had a stated policy of saying, I'm not gonna, I don't know if there's a bubble or not, I'll clean up the mess when it blows. And that's the policy he was pursuing. There was not a regulator in sight and the chief regulator was sitting right there and saying it's not my problem. Okay, uh, and the question for Mark. Uh, they, I believe that, uh, that Robert Schiller uh, called, called up the price, what some call the price bubble, a price boom, but he specifically stated uh, recently, in fact, that, and I, I believe that uh, John quoted, that, that the price boom, the biggest price boom started in early 97 and went through 2006 and that it was more than half done uh, more than halfway through as a, as a bubble or boom by 2003. Would you now acknowledge that based on prices that that did indeed occur uh, and that there was indeed a major boom bubble that, that, that occurred from 97 through 2003 through 2006? Do you acknowledge that in terms of John's argument? No. Uh, I think a bubble, a housing, a bubble, any, a bubble in any market. Well, we'll call it a boom. Let's call it a boom. Not a bubble. Call it no, a let's call it a bubble. Well, yeah. You, okay. It's a bubble. Okay, it's a then bubble then when then people are buying homes or any asset, a stock, uh, can, can, a commercial property, whatever it is, based simply on the fact that they think that property is going to be worth a lot more soon in the future and I can sell it can, to someone. Can I, can I change my question, Mark, and yeah. he called it a okay. boom? Just answer, can I just simply say he called it a boom, so let's call it a boom. He said there was a price boom from t starting in 97 that went through 2006. Do you acknowledge Schiller's point that there was a price boom, uh, as he put it, not a bubble, he, put, he called it a boom. So was it a boom? That's, that uh, was the uh, debate. That okay, was let the me point. answer the question this way. Okay, yeah. The, between, up and through 2003, yeah. the increase in housing values was very consistent with underlying fundamentals that drive uh, housing demand and house price growth. The, there was strong house price growth, but it, you know, if you go look at the data, look at any house price index you want to look at, Case Schiller, his index, look at the FHFA at the time of FAO price series, price growth was five, four, five, six percent per annum. This is through mid-2003, and household income growth in that period, on average, was four, five, six percent. Rent growth was four, five, six percent. Construction costs were four, five, six percent. These are the fundamentals that drive underlying housing values. Now, there was a period when uh, it got juiced up after the equity market fell, because people 
pulled money out of the equity market. This was, you know, 2001 was the crash in the equity market. And people said, well, where do I put my money? And they started putting it into the, into the housing market. The real switch went on in between mid-2003 and early 2007. It was in that period that house price growth went from 4, 5, 6%. Pick your index. I know this data because I model it. This is what I do for a living. I model it. It, it went up into the double digits per annum increase between mid-2003 and mid-2007. And that was a bubble. That was a bubble because house price growth was disconnected from the growth in the underlying fundamentals, and that was speculation. And so it was that period when this metastasized and became a, a problem for the financial system and ultimately the economy. So no, I don't, I don't at all agree with the idea that there was a bubble prior to, okay. sorry, a boom. A boom. There was a, but okay. that, I'm not, okay, whatever. Well, I mean, there was you, a you bubble were, post-2003. You insisted on the word bubble, so that's why I said uh, Schiller used the word boom. He said it was the one, number one boom that started in 97 and went through 2006. Okay. Boom is different than a bubble. You can have a boom okay. if it's supported by underlying good fundamentals, right? Okay, fair enough. Yeah, uh, comment from John. I think Schiller meant a bubble. <laughs> and uh, anybody that was in the lending business was observ observing the obvious fact. This goes back to the early 19, uh, the late 1990s. The price relative to people's income, therefore debt service when you finance a house relative to income was headed up very rapidly and reached in the late 1990s equivalents to the early 1990s when we had a housing bus and the early 1980s when we house, had, a, had a housing bus. Uh, and, and, and the price uh, to rents was going nuts, uh, or in the early 1990s. We thought we were going to have a housing correction in the early 2000s when the stock markets were correcting. This is when Greenspan stepped on the gas, that was in this slide, and started pumping out money like crazy by, by lowering rent interest rates. But more than that, rates, pri prices should have been falling. When you have a huge increase in productivity because the entry of the Chinese and the Indians in the world market, prices would normally fall. If you think about if productivity is rising very rapidly, if, if you had a stable money supply, prices would be falling. If you don't let prices fall, it's worse than normal inflation because people don't realize in, uh, inflation is happening and they become overly optimistic. And that, is, that spurs a massive increase in consumption. And housing is consumption, not investment. So we had a huge misallocation of capital away from capital investment. We weren't putting anything in capital. We were running, you know, the savings gluts is, a, is fake because U.S. savings rates were falling. And, 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 and we were over-investing in consumption and housing. And it, sh it would have corrected in the early 1990s. We'd have had a little worse correction then, and then we wouldn't have had the, had the run-up. Now, I agree with Mark. At the end of the bubble, a lot of people fools jumped on, just like they do in the stock market. But the momentum was already there. That, that's what carries that kind of stuff up. The, the bubble had already started, and it got blown up by a bunch of fools that should have gone broke. Uh, but, but they were secondary players. Um, uh Good, thanks. And uh, uh, now also uh, a moderator obligation to ask you before the audience asks questions, do you want to ask each other a question now or do you want to wait for audience questions? You always have the prerogative to ask each other other question. You want to wave on that or, or ask each other a question? Okay, no? no? Questions from the audience, please phrase your question as a question as best you can. Uh, first question. <laughs> Don't identify yourself as a person, your credentials. Don't, don't identify? You're just a solo forum person asking. Yeah. Very well. Well, it's a privilege to be here. I don't care what here. your name is. Yeah. Uh, my name is Paul Mueller. I teach economics downtown. I have students here. We I assign both of your books. We don't, we don't care. You're just here. All right. Solo. Here's my question for Mark. Mark, so it seems that uh, underwriting standards are really important in this story and, and, and the, the declining underwriting standards. So my question is, with Countrywide and IndyMac and these other sorts of unregulated uh, lenders in sort of the subprime area, uh, who was buying their loans in, in 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002, before the private market and the investment banks jumped on that? So who was buying them? And could you comment on uh, Alt-A loans and, and sort of the difference between traditional prime loans and Alt-A loans, which are not to poor people, and yet are not the traditional prime loans with 20% down and other sorts of things? Thank you. Well, I, I think back in the late 90s, early 2000s, before things really got going, these, these companies were a shadow of the market. Uh, they were very small. I mean, Countrywide was the biggest, and it was still you know, a pretty small player at the time. It really didn't, these, these companies really didn't become 
significant players in the mortgage market until that period, you know, when you saw the private level securities market really take off, you know, in two th between 2003 and early 2007. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think they, it was, they were inconsequential in the grand scheme, uh, grand scheme of things. Right. So what was your second question? I uh, about all day loans. Oh, uh, well, when I say subprime, generally in the context of this kind of a, a group, I'm also considering alt A, uh, option arms, uh, neg am arms. I'm, I'm really throwing in the whole, any mortgage loan that you basically can't make today, right? Because one of the regulatory changes in Dodd-Frank was the so-called qualified mortgage rule. But this is, this is this, believe this or not, this, this rule is if you're a mortgage lender, you can't make a loan to a borrower who can't afford to pay it. That's the rule, right? That rule was not in place before Dodd-Frank. And these are the loans that are no longer in existence because borrowers can't afford to pay them, right? Uh, so uh, I, I include all of that in, in when I say, when I say subprime, you know, for this kind of an audience, uh, not for, you know, econ professor, but, you know, for this kind of audience, uh, or, although maybe you're all econ professors. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not me. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Uh, John, do you want to comment? No, okay. Uh, next question. Hi. Um, do either of you view what is going on currently with student, uh, student loans to be anything similar to what happened uh, with the, the housing bubble? Uh, so if you, and if you do think it is uh, a similar boom or, or bubble, uh, is there anything we can take from what happened back in 2008 that we can use to uh, avert a similar catastrophe if that bubble, if it is a bubble, does uh, burst? Let me give it to John first because you went first. Uh, John, Mark, you go. first. Okay, go ahead, Mark. It's, a great, it's an interesting question. I, I think there is a key similarity, and that is that um, if you uh, increase the amount of leverage to purchase something, I mean, you allow people to borrow money, and lenders extend credit to buy something, and it's against a, something that has a relatively fixed supply. It's hard to increase the supply. What happens is the price goes up, right? You're just increasing demand, and that's to some degree what happened in the mortgage market, right? You threw all this borrowing onto the housing market and you had, the supply was increasing but not enough and so that dr helped to drive up prices. Um, that's the same principle that in the loan, uh, student loan market. We are subsidizing demand. We're giving subsidy to increase the demand for educational services and that's a very fixed supply, right? So all you're doing is jacking up tuition. So at the end of the day, you're not really helping anybody. The poor kids are just loaded up with debt, uh, and you're on the you know uh, a treadmill. So the implication for me, I mean, my takeaway from that, and th now I'm talking as an economist without the strictures of policy and and having to make legislation that works, just as an economist, I would say I would take that subsidy that we're putting into student loan debt instead of making the interest rate low and making it more available, I take that subsidy, that money, that taxpayer money, and I use that to increase the supply of educational services, right? Community colleges, uh, technical schools, um, e-learning. Uh, increase the supply. So if you increase the supply, you bring down the cost. These kids don't have that debt, and they have access to better educational services. It's easy to say, and it, you know, it's, it, it's very difficult to get there from here, but if I were king for the day, that's the path I would go down. Um, you know, you I'd kind of like to add just a comment. I, I agree with Mark's analysis of what student debt has done. It's just dri driven up the price of universities. I think it is like the housing bond bubble in this sense in that it's causing a massive misallocation of resources. Because what's happening, and you, I'm very involved in the educational process, a lot of people are going to universities, spending a lot of money, not graduating, or graduating with degrees where their productivity hadn't been increased. So you've got a misallocation of the most valuable resource of all, the human mind. There's a lot of students in universities today that ought to be in some kind of, I don't, I don't want to call technical training demeaning. They ought to be learning how to do other things than what liberal arts universities tend to teach them to do. And I think, so it's a double whammy. It's the, the, it's the economics Mark talked about, but it's also a, you know, you're seeing something like 25% of the kids that graduate with college degrees are getting jobs they don't need college degrees for. That's uh, sad. Can I make one other yeah. quick point? 
So one big difference is that there's 1.3 trillion in student loan debt outstanding. 1.15 trillion is government backed, right? So uh, it's a taxpayer problem. In the mortgage market, just go back to my slide, the vast, vast majority of the debt was private market debt. And when that blew up, that became a financial system problem. And that's why that, that period in 2008, 2009 was the financial crisis. It took out the financial system. The student loan problem won't take out the financial system. It, it's our problem as taxpayers. We did have a uh, debate at the SOA Forum about uh, college uh, a few months ago. I refer you to that on our website. Uh, the video and the audio are both available. Uh, next question. Mark, this one's for you. So private label securities at the epicenter of the crisis. Uh, investors bought them. Investors are bad. Market failure. Boom. You're done. Who bought them? People who bought them for the rating. Were they just bad investors? They read Consumer Reports, bought the wrong car, it was a lemon? Why did they buy them if they had a AAA on them? Is it because the bank capital rules said they could be undercapitalized and hold 0.6% of capital to hold them? So if a nationally recognized statistical rating organization went to a bank that's regulated by the government that said you could hold 0.6% of capital if you bought a AAA security, and then clever people on Wall Street, maybe not dissimilar from me, went out and figured out a way to have some prime borrowers speculate on houses that were going up 10% a year to have Moody's and S&P issue AAA securities to banks that could hold 0.6% of capital. How is that not a government-induced distortion of markets? How do you not support the resolution? You were, you were, you, you were not in charge of the ratings, Mark. I say that on your behalf, so, so, but go ahead. No, no, it's, uh, I'm, I'm sympathetic with what you're saying. It goes to the point I made earlier about lack of regulation, that um, the system was undercapitalized, and it was undercapitalized across the system. You mentioned one aspect of it. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac hold, held 40 basis points of capital you know, back prior to the crisis. So if there was a government failure, it was a government failure of regulation. So I'm, I'm, I don't disagree with that. I, I, I think that did contribute. Now, that wasn't the cause of the crisis. That was an exacerbating force that made the crisis as severe as it was. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac didn't cause the crisis. But when the losses started to mount because of what happened in the private markets and house prices started to decline as a result, that wiped out their very thin capital. They failed and it exacerbated the financial, uh, the financial crisis. It wasn't the cause, it was, a, it was a, uh, a, 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 a factor that contributed to the severity of the downturn. But if, I, if I could start well, New Century well, and please, put it- Please, please, oh, no. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, we only a question, and we, we, and we have a lot of other questions. Uh, John, could We can talk on? offline, I'm yeah. very happy to. Uh, yeah, uh, no, of course, talk offline, and uh, you are sticking around for the booze, right? You uh, talk, are you talk, paying? <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> talk, for Standard Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch had a government-created oligopoly where basically they could, they were the only rating agencies that you could use for evaluating bonds and pension funds. So they, they owned the bond rating business. They misrated lots of instruments dramatically. Uh, and that was government regulation that gave them the oligopoly, by the way. Uh, one, I told you my company, bb t went through the financial crisis without a single quarterly loss. One reason is we wouldn't use Standard Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch's ratings uh, because I'd been through the, the economic correction early 80s. I'd been through the economic correction early 90s. I looked at these things and said, any fool knows these are high-risk instruments, and they've wrecked, wrecked them triple, triple A. I mean, remember this, too, though, in terms of regulators. They, there was a regulation. You had to keep half as much capital in a subprime mortgage as you did to a loan to Exxon. Now, you want to create an incentive for people to do subprime mortgages? Uh, encourage banks to put half the capital in a subprime mortgage. And if you don't do that, by the way, that puts a lot of pressure on you because you can't perform as high in the short term. You know the other guy's going broke, but, you know, you got to stay in business in the short term. So it put a lot of pressure on healthy institutions to do stupid stuff. And some of them did and some of them didn't. Next question. Uh, well, to continue on the, that theme, uh, as Mark Sandy pointed out, uh, one of the contributing factors was the undue reliance on these uh, uh, ratings. Um, and in retrospect, they turned out to be worth not much more than a peewee soccer trophy. Um, has anything been done by the rating agencies to uh, improve their rate or make them actually worth something anymore? Um, yeah, 
maybe John should go first. No, I think Mark just, should just, answer that. He works just, for Moody's. <laughs> That's not, not fair. Let him go first. Okay, you're always first, Mark. Go ahead. No, um, and um, uh, I, I'm sympathetic of the criticisms of the rating agencies. They, I mean, like many of uh, players in the system, they screwed up. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, yes, there has been some changes. Uh, uh, you remember uh, in my opening remarks, I talked about the rating agency's state of policy of not underwriting the underlying mortgages that it went into the securities. Uh, that has changed. So now they're, uh, uh, they use randomized sampling to go in, take a look at the mortgages, and they underwrite. They can't underwrite every mortgage because there's millions of mortgages, but that, that statistically is uh, you know, an adequate uh, way of, uh, of, of uh, approaching it. Uh, the... Um, the uh, kind of internal controls. You know, another problem the rating agencies had back in pre-crisis was a problem with uh, something called ratings shopping. That would be the investment banks would go to each of the uh, to the rating agencies and play one off the other and say, if you give me, basically, it was you know obviously not this blatant, but this was kind of the way uh, things were, were being done. They would say, you know, if, if I get a better rating, you'll get this the, the deal and of course the fee. Uh, that now is, uh, you, there's no, uh, given all the changes in regula regulation and regulatory oversight, rating shopping is a very, uh, very, very unlikely thing to happen going forward. Possible, but we, now we have very strong regulatory controls and oversight over that process to make that much less likely. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, no, can I just say, this is a good point. This is a really good point. Well, so you're right. Sure. Uh, you know, the inherent, there feels like there's an inherent conflict, right, when you say, uh, the investors pay the, for the rating. So if, I, if someone's paying for the rating, then the uh, agency is going to give a rating that the, the investors want. And I, you know, I think that's uh, clearly a, a, a problem, an issue. Uh, but the thing is, uh, no one's come up with a better mousetrap because, you know, I mean, you don't, I mean, when I say, I should have said, the, the rating agency is paid by the issuer, not by the investor, right? It's the issuer that pays for it not the investor. There's, uh, you know, ideas that maybe the investor should pay for it. That's a pretty bad idea. Would you really want, you know, a hedge fund to be paying for the ratings? Uh, probably not. Uh, there's been th ideas uh, floated around of randomly selecting rating agencies to do it so that you can't have this, this, this problem. There's all kinds of issues with that in terms of quality of the ratings and the analysis that's done. So at the end of the day, the system has now fallen back on let's keep the same approach, the same model, but let's improve the regulatory controls and oversight, better and more stringent regulation that wasn't there, you know, pre-crisis. Does that mean that we're not going to have a problem in the future? You know, uh, I don't know, but it's less likely we're going to have a problem in the future. And you, we should fundamentally ask, you know, we, the rating agencies are a, 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 an easy whipping boy. Uh, but they are there for a reason, and I won't go, we, that's a whole other discussion, maybe another debate, <laughs> but it's actually quite interesting to ask yourself, why do we have rating agencies? Uh, because they play a very important role in the system. Coming uh, by John? Or? Yeah, I, I, I think Mark's right, they've taken a lot of steps, but I would say this, uh, now I'm retired from bb and but not, the, the day I retired, we were still underwriting the bonds ourselves. We didn't trust the rating agencies. Uh, and our experiences, sometimes their ratings were pretty good and sometimes they weren't. So uh, I think anybody that's really a sophisticated buyer, you can, you can, write, you can write these things yourself within a, within a range just by reading the instruments in there. So and, I, and did I say that I'm not in the rating industry? I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I've said yeah. that on yeah, your okay. behalf, Mark. Just making that clear. <laughs> yeah. uh, next question. Some of this has already been uh, answered as I've been standing in the line, but I, I wanted to ask John, can you give us some specific examples of the pressure that was put on BB&T uh, to make loans uh, and, or, or to, to uh, join into the bubble as it was, as it was going up? And, and the second part, what did you do to resist it? <laughs> How were you able to resist it, particularly being in the middle of a... A, uh, a low-income and heavily minority community like you were. <clears throat> yeah, well, the pressure came from two sides. <clears throat> it came from the banking regulators themselves, the FDIC and the Federal Reserve, who 
were very regulatory act active. The idea that, that we were uh, deregulations of serve, you can read the record, <laughs> regulations went off the chart. A lot of it was about compliance and not about uh, lending. But on the lending side, there was huge pressure to m get you to make affordable housing, low income, minority loans. Uh, but what, what were the years, John? To just tell the years, go ahead, in your account. What years was this? Uh, the, it started back with Bill Clinton in the, in the mid-1990s. And remember, Clinton was elected by a strong African-American community, and he wanted to pay them back. He believed there was discrimination in the banking business. I don't believe there ever was. We certainly weren't discriminating. Uh, but they put intense pressure on this starting in the late 1990s. And then Freddie and Fannie, when they, particularly when they had their accounting problems, they had to keep their government guarantees because they, they, they were leveraged at one point, 1,000 to one. I mean, they, they were broke already before they were broke. But they, got, they survived with government guarantees. Then they ca called us. We were originating for Freddie and Fannie, which we would have done, except they have a government guarantee and they have a lower cost of capital, which made it impossible for us to portfolio mortgages. Uh, and they had driven down the standards radically to meet this affordable housing goal, which they bragged about, by the way. I mean, they were, they were proud of what they were doing. And they were told us they were going to cut us off from our prime business unless we did more subprime business. So we danced around that. There was also investor pressure to have the high performance you could get in the short term from doing this terrible stuff. Um, One of our big yeah, competitors was Wachovia. Yeah. We've uh, actually run out of time for the questions. Uh, Mark, do, do you want to uh, make a comment about what John just said or about his own or uh, what do you want to do? Uh, no, that's okay. Yeah, okay. No, All no, right. No, sure. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Unfortunately, uh, no more time for questions. Plenty of time to talk to the debaters uh, after the debate. Uh, we're now going to go to the summary portion of the evening. John Allison, you're up with your summary. My summary is pretty basic. It is uh, true that a number of private financial institutions played an important role in creating the financial crisis. However, the primary culprits were the Federal Reserve and government housing policy, specifically Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, but also the FHA, VA, and regulatory pressure that uh, you could have half as much capital in a uh, in a subprime mortgage as you could do a loan to Exxon, along with lots of other regulatory pr pressure. It is not true that the banking industry was deregulated. You can look at the record. There was a huge increase in regulations during this period of time. And, and certainly there was plenty of greed on Wall Street. Okay, I've been in the banking business 40-something years, and there's always plenty of greed on Wall Street. Uh, some of it's good, some of it's bad. There was no new amount of greed going on on Wall Street. Um, it is hard, unless you were down, down in, the, in the trenches, when the, people get all these kind of numbers and pull this stuff out, you can't measure it the way it's being measured because a lot of the private losses weren't technically in CRA loans. They weren't technically in private mortgage-backed securities. They were in loans that financial institutions were making. And by the way, we, we keep saying that Countrywide and IndyMac and Bank America, Citigroup, they were all regulated institutions. A huge percentage of the, of the bad loans came out of companies that, in fact, were regulated and were encouraged to do subprime lending. And we got the consequence. It was a moral crusade. It's interesting people now, uh, Barney Frank and Dodd, the, the guys at the Dodd-Frank bill, they were the huge advocates of this crazy lending at the time. I talked to both of them. Uh, we tried to show them that it's going to end badly, and they just weren't interested in it because it was a moral uh, goal for them. But we said, well, this ends badly for the borrowers. But no, no, this is the right thing to do. So it was a moral persuasion, and the influence down in the trenches was dramatic. And yes, there were a lot of crazy people that did stupid stuff at the end of the cycle, after the bubble had already blown up. Thank you. Thanks, Gene. Well, well, thank you. It was a, a very uh, uh, enjoyable evening and great debate. And again, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I really do appreciate it. And, um, you know, uh, I'm an economist. I look at the data. I stick to the data. And, you know, the most telling statistic is the chart I showed. Uh, the amount of mortgage debt that the private label securities market accounted for in the late 90s and early 2000s was less than 10%. By 2006, early 2007, at the peak of the bubble, uh, 
it was over 20% at the same time as the share of mortgage debt that went to the private level securities market increased, the share of mortgage debt that went to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac declined almost percentage point to percentage point. Um, I mean, uh, I think that's pretty clear uh, who uh, led the way here and who is the principal culprit in causing the financial crisis. But let me just say a couple of things about the future um, and what we can take away from this. Uh, first thing I'd say is, um, I feel better about the financial system post-crisis because I do think uh, the regulatory oversight and regulatory framework today is in a much better place than it was 10 years ago. The system is highly capitalized, uh, very liquid. Uh, there's good risk management. Uh, they're stress testing their portfolios. Uh, they're adopting counting standards that uh, are more consistent with prudent risk management. I think the odds, because of this improvement in the regulatory uh, environment uh, and um, oversight, the odds of a financial crisis on the scale of what we experienced 10 years ago now are very, very low. Um, they're just unlikely to happen, certainly not in my lifetime. Having said that, though, I am an economist, and I can't end on a positive note. Um, you know, uh, there are things to worry about. And uh, when you think about the financial system, uh, I mean, my simplistic way of thinking about it, there is the regulated part of the system, the system that John's bank, bb and is in, the banking system, the depository institutions. They account for about half of all of the credit provided to the economy. The other half is the so-called shadow financial system. And it's shadow because it's not transparent. Uh, there's no light, much less regulated. And there are things going on in the shadow system that we need to watch. Uh, and parts of the shadow market that are as ill-defined as the subprime market was 10 years ago. So this is uh, going to be a never-ending battle. And you know, we're going to go back and forth about government and private markets. Uh, but that battle is not over. Uh, it's, gonna, it's something we're going to have to grapple with uh, going forward. And if you really want to know what I'm worried about, you'll have to ask me back for another debate. Thank you. Well, thank you both for a very spirited debate. Uh, we now uh, go into the final voting portion of the evening. Again, please go back into your apps. Uh, the financial crisis of 2008 was caused mainly by government-induced distortion of markets rather than caused mainly uh, by uh, 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 intrinsic market failure. Please vote yes, no, or undecided on the resolution. Okay, 60.6% uh, uh, voted for the resolution on the pre. That was 60%. That rose to 70.8%, picked up 10.1% points. That's the number to beat. Uh, the no went from 157 to 17 to nearly 18, picked up two and a quarter, both gained votes, but uh, the yes votes vote more, gained more. John, you get the Tootsie Roll. Congratulations to you guys.